The China Global South podcast is supported in part by the Africa China Reporting Project at Wits University in Johannesburg and by our subscribers. Thank you. If you'd like to subscribe for daily news and exclusive analysis about every aspect of China's engagement in Africa, Asia, and throughout the developing world, go to chinaglobalsouth.com forward slash subscribe. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China Global South podcast. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by CGSP's managing editor, Kobus van Staden, in Johannesburg, South Africa. A very happy new year to you, Kobus. Happy new year. Well, this is our first show of 2024. Apologies that we were a little bit late in getting off the ground this year. It took us a couple of weeks. We've got a whole bunch of other things that we're working on, but we have got some fantastic shows lined up for you this year. Kobus, there is a lot going on in the new year so far. Some of the issues that we're tracking in our daily coverage in the newsletter for our subscribers relates to the China-Philippine standoff. Obviously, Wang Yi is now touring Africa and will later next week head to the Latin America Caribbean region. And then, of course, there are all the events in the Red Sea and the Mideast that are going on where China is also playing an increasingly prominent role. Kobus, before we get into our discussion today about timber and logging and the environment. Let's just get a quick update from you on what Wang Yi is doing and the countries that he's visiting, both in Africa and then later in the Latin America Caribbean basin. Tell us more about what is going on. So Wang's itinerary this time takes him to particularly North and West Africa, which is a little unusual. Usually they cover all of the different quadrants of the continent. But he travels to Egypt, to Tunisia, to Togo and to Cote d'Ivoire. And then he's traveling on to Brazil and to Jamaica. Egypt was, was unusual in the sense that it's the second year in a row that the foreign minister went to Egypt. And we think, or I think, it, 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 it probably has a lot to do with Middle East politics and, and the fact that Egypt is sitting right next to the Israel crisis. And while he was in Egypt, he also met with the Arab League and made a big kind of splashy call for a peace conference in Israel. Um, so, you know, I assume that it kind of informed the choice of, of Egypt. And then it's notable, I think, in particularly in Africa, that he the rest of the countries are all Francophone, all former French colonies, all with different complicated relationships with France. So, you know, so, so uh, in, you know, very shortly after anti-French, you know, because sentiment was so strong in, in the Sahel particularly. It's notable, I think, that, that this time China is really leaning into former French colonies, um, although it's impossible to say exactly whether, you know, kind of whether that was really a, you know, a key reason to go, but it is notable anyway. During his first stop in Egypt, he also threw some shade towards the Americans for the countermeasures that both the Americans and the British are taking in the Red Sea against the Houthi militants in Yemen who've been launching attacks on cargo ships in the Red Sea. The Chinese have expressed some frustration with those measures as they are prone to do when the United States takes action outside of the UN mandate and the UN system. And both Ambassador Zhang Jun at the United Nations Security Council, as well as Wang Yi, said they did not support those measures taken by the Americans. Again, that's a topic that we are following every day in our newsletter coverage and on our site. And so if these are topics you're interested in, we encourage you to sign up. But let's talk today about the environment. And we came off of last year with the COP28 summit. And again, Kobus, you and I, I don't actually know how you feel about this. I'm not a big fan of these COP summits. I know they bring everybody together to talk about these things, but I never feel that anything that comes out of it is binding because at the end of the day, there is this question of enforcement. There's a question of political will and economics. And those three things seem to always conspire to undermine the ability to stop the destruction that is leading to our own peril at the hands of climate change. But there was a fascinating report that came out last year that you covered in our newsletter, Cobus, The Dictator's Door, that was produced by the Environmental Investigation Agency tracing timber, illegally logged timber, from Equatorial Guinea to Asia, processed in China, and then made its way into the U.S. to be purchased at Home Depot for products like doors and other wood supplies. Then, just earlier this year, the new year, 
Uh, the Environmental Investigation Agency published a column in The Hill, which is one of the most popular rags inside of the Beltway. So if you are a policy nerd inside of Washington, you read The Hill very closely to halt global deforestation, start with Home Depot. So, Cobus, when we talk about this environmental issue, too often the first place that people focus on is the role of the Chinese. Certainly, Chinese illegal logging in East Africa, West Africa are critical problems. But I think one of the things that we want to set for our discussion today is that they are not the only actor that's complicit in all of this. No, I think the real kind of gravity of Chinese involvement isn't only Chinese logging. And I mean, you know, obviously Chinese logging companies play a a, a very controversial role around the world, but it's more specifically the opacity of Chinese supply chains, which feed into the massiveness of China as a timber processing entity. You know, so the issue is that China makes huge numbers of things. And in those things are a lot of the doors one would buy at places like Home Depot. Um, doors and windows. And in order to make them, they use a lot of wood. And, you know, a lot of that wood gets imported in shady ways. And then they lose track of where it came from originally, or they maybe never knew. So it becomes very, very difficult to track them. And in order to protect the kind of opacity of these supply chains, massive corruption is involved. And so African policymakers are squarely in the middle of this whole nightmare. Well, let's dive into this issue with one of the people who did the investigation into the dictator's door report by the Environmental Investigation Agency. Ma Haibing is an Asia policy specialist at the Environmental Investigation Agency. He's based in Washington, D.C. and joins us on the line on the show for the first time. A very good morning to you, Haibing. Hi, Eric and Corbus. Hello, everybody. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. It's great to have you on the program, and I'm really happy that we're starting off the new year talking about environmental issues and supply chains. Let's talk about The Dictator's Door, the report that you contributed to along with your colleagues at EIA. Give us the overview of these opaque supply chains that Cobus talked about and how timber makes it from West Africa through Asia to China and eventually to suburban America in places like Home Depot. Yes, happy to do that. I guess to us, you know, the global timber trade is kind of like, you know, like uh, everything happened on globalization. Uh, it has all the pros, you know, because it uh, increased trade values, increase, you know, the local GDPs, but it also have some shadows, you know, have some, um, you know, unintended uh, results. And uh, some of the DC activity, you know, we found is, you know, is definitely demonstration of that. Uh, so basically, we view this as a you know supply chain issue. So it's not just particular like one country or one party uh, like play a vital role. It's actually uh, it's a network of uh, all the actions you know uh, with all the actors connected that contributed the whole illicity uh, and also the shady part uh, into that. So in this particular case, on the Equatorial Guinea side, first. They have the laws, you know, the, the, the published uh, the multiple regulations, you know, about you know, the, 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 the forest governance, uh, like the, the, the log harvest, you know, uh, regulation and also uh, a log export ban because of the uh, severe uh, illegal harvesting, the, the particularly for a period like, you know, actually ban the export of uh, logs like uh, around the wood. But it's um, the Chinese businessmen, because of the demand, like, you know, the, the, the took advantage of the, uh, the system that's not that perfect, you know, the, the using bribing and other uh, methods, you know, to get around of those uh, regulations and, and uh, you know, get this uh, wood out. And uh, back to China, uh, using China's massive uh, manufacturing power as, you know, the world hub of manufacturing, uh, turn those uh, logs into a veneer, which is a thin layer, usually as a decorative products uh, to apply to a core material, then turn into uh, you know plywood, then using the uh, plywood to turn into the components for other furniture uh, or like doors or, or other furniture, then ship out either to EU or US market. And in this case, Home Depot and the uh in you know, the US market as 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 uh, end client. Uh, on the US end, they do have like Lacey Act and other regulations try to govern uh, timber products, you know, international trade. But unfortunately, some of the, you know, requirement is really challenging, uh, you know, to fulfill uh, in this case because 
the whole process in China is a black box to them. And uh, the reporting requirement, like, you know, the, the harvest, the origins, uh, also have some loopholes into that. So in the end, either Home Depot or JLM, you know, didn't catch up, uh, you know, the least active, the, the, you know, involved in the supply chain. So you see, it's at least the three parts play a role in here. The original country, in this case, is Equatorial Guinea. The, the lack of enforcement of the uh, law and also the corruption uh, within the system, you know, like uh, facilitate this kind of uh, illicit uh, trade. And also the Chinese uh, businessmen, they don't abide by the local laws and the, the try to take advantage of any loopholes in the uh, sourcing country. And it didn't help, like, you know, within China, their regulations didn't take a uh, full, full uh, you know, enforcement on imported timber. They take it very seriously on, you know, the local harvest timber, but uh, uh, it's not very clear on the law, like, you know, how to deal with uh, the imported timber. They didn't take the 100% of energy to check about the legality of the imported timber, which in this case, also kind of, uh, you know, uh, endure the illicit, illicit you know, uh, aspect of that uh, part. And in the end, in the client, you know, and you consuming and the Lacey Act or other regulations, you know, heighten is encountering uh, like challenges, you know, how to enforce it in, in, uh, in a full scale, you know. So at least to me, to us, you know, it's all those three parts, three uh, players uh, at least, you know, is a uh, is a uh, you know uh, all play a role like a contribute uh, to the a lack of enforcement of this whole supply chain. So you mentioned Equatorial Guinea. So I wonder if we can maybe start there. The report was fascinating in also making the point that it's not only general officials in Equatorial Guinea that are, you know, involved in timber corruption, but it's actually those officials include the vice president who happens to be the son of the sitting president. Um, so I wonder if you could talk a little bit about Equatorial Guinea and, you know, kind of its corruption problems and the way that that affects this story that you're telling. Yeah, we found it always being a problem, you know, uh, for the sourcing country. Because on one hand, they usually have, uh, you know, all those, you know, very explicit uh, laws or regulations, you know, that uh, try to govern, you know, the progress sector, you know. Uh, um, but in reality, there are certain officials, including a very prestigious, you know, level of officials, in this case, President Sons, try to take advantage of that, try to distort enforcement of laws. And um, it happens a lot uh, in our investigation. Most of the, the, the major source of the timber uh, happens to be the, the least governance uh, you know, uh, as a country in the world. If you're looking at the you know, international, you know, the, the governance transparency index, uh, you know, most of the country are falling to the lower end of that index. This is a huge problem. It needs also, you know, not just, you know, international communities to kind of like, you know, pressure, but also needs, you know, the, the domestic people, you know, uh, require them, their engagement, their, you know, democratic, you know, action, you know, to give it a more kind of a transparency check on their own government, on their own officials, you know. Yeah, we were trying to actually uh, encourage this uh, activity in other countries in Africa, you know, trying to boost the transparency and the traceability part, you know, within the country to mobilize the people uh, in the country instead of just, you know, silly, uh, simply rely on international community. Your report focuses on Equatorial Guinea. You've talked about that this is not a problem unique to Equatorial Guinea. Over the years, we've done reporting on this from the Republic of Congo, Gabon, Nigeria, Ghana. In fact, we just have a report that was published this week on our site with the headline, Lack of Political Will in Ghana Fuels Illegal Rosewood Logging Smuggling to China. So this is a problem, as you rightly pointed out, that extends to a number of different countries of varying degrees of governance. Now, the key question is, if you've got the president's son involved, what hope do you have to have any type of implementation of the laws that may be on the book in Equatorial Guinea in a country that has very weak state capacity, but also corruption that runs right down to the core of the system? How can anything be done really, realistically, in a system like that? Yeah, Erica, you were asking a million dollar question here. Yes, exactly. That's uh, always been a question. We have been puzzled with that. And uh, I think every sourcing country have been puzzled with that. Uh, with that. And uh, believe me, even the Chinese businessmen, you know, they are puzzled with that. Our investigator, you know, reflected that, you know, the Chinese businessmen, they don't want to deal with such, a, you know, a, a cooperative system. They want to do it in a correct way. 
But the difference is that, you know, since they saw, like, you know, there is nothing they can do there, they just, you know, go along with that or try to uh, use that. You know, that's the, you know, the so called Chinese. Well, they could walk away. I mean, they could walk away. They could walk away, but that's not the Chinese basement, you know, you know it's not Chinese. Okay, fair enough. But it's not like they're the victim here and saying, oh, well, there's nothing else we can do. But they, and this is the same problem with illegal mining, illegal fishing. The Chinese look at the system and are, end up behaving very pragmatically. Well, if this is the way it happens in this country, this is what we're going to do. But they could walk away, and the Chinese government could put pressure on these businessmen to do better at sourcing them and also not allowing uh, these materials into the country. We've seen that the Chinese can be incredibly effective when they want to be with ivory, for example. And yet they choose. That's also after long years of like pressure, yeah, from the international community. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. But it's possible, though. That's the key thing. It's definitely possible. That's why we're trying to push forward the old policy improvement in China. Is that exactly the same message? If you know the top political uh, heads, you know, decided that's the correct thing to do, that they have the most effective ways to enforce that. And after this sunny lands, you know, statement between China and the U.S., we see, uh, you know, glimpse of uh, bright light into that. But it all depends on what they are doing this year and the following years. You know, so far we haven't seen uh, any very positive or uh, you know, action on that. But we just hope, you know, but because everybody knows that once Chinese leaders make a pledge, usually they are very quick, you know, to get it enforced. But we just have to see. So in some of the coverage I read about the regional dictator's door report once it came out, that it was mentioned that this issue was raised to some Chinese stakeholders and then they kind of said, well, we can we really can't do anything until there's an official complaint from the African side, if I if I remember that correctly. So I was wondering about if you could talk a little bit about that dynamic. Like, you know, kind of is is it a situation where one needs to elicit or mobilize political will on the African side to complain about this first before there'll be any action on the Chinese side? Or is there a way of motivating on the Chinese side directly? To us, as we uh, observe it, it's a, a global supply chain issue. And that a fundamental solution to that is also be a multiplayer, uh, you know, collaboration, you know, from the US and, uh, you know, from the end market uh, side like EU and the US, they should try very hard, you know, to fill in those loopholes uh, in the enforcement of EU, either EUTR or, or, or you know, the US Lacey Act, and trying to, to make it uh, more applicable, you know, because some of the requirement, you know, if you're down to the customer level, we talk to the customer agency, uh, you know, uh, the, 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 the agents, they're complaining that, you know, they have the hard time, you know, to fulfill the, the detail, the, the duties. Uh, but on the, and again, on the China side, you know, as we all, you know, uh, uh, emphasize, then they should make it very clear, like, you know, they are, they are uh, so serious about the legality of the input of timber, you know, and, uh, and put the whole heart into that and put all the efforts into that. So far, uh, it's very vague there, you know, uh, they can do more, of course. And on the origins, the source of the timber, uh, like the, the sourcing country, definitely they need a lot of improvement on the enforcement and on the transparency. But traceability actually is, is a key uh, because so far, all the laws that the, the, the published, the only folks, you know, just put on paper, there's there, but there's no actual system, you know, no actual manpower, uh, you know, put on a, a force of uh, actual traceability. That's why we, we work so hard in Gabon to build up this kind of a transparent traceability system, like not just the government officials, even every regular citizens have the tool to track any timbers, uh, you know, travel on the road, and which make it, you know, like a, a public thing, like, you know, every public can use the smartphone, can scan on the, you know, the, the code, or any, you know, timber transportation uh, uh, tools, and uh, uh, instantly find out, you know, their all the information about it, then check on the legality. I think with such a system, you know, in the sourcing country is a key to ensure, you know, a uh, full uh, legal, you know, enforcement of the, you know, of the, uh, of the existing laws. I think we might want to be a little skeptical, though, sometimes that those traceability systems can be forged, as we've seen in the Congo, with the traceability of cobalt coming from artisanal mines. And people were just putting on the right tags, and then it said this was from an industrial mine or did not use child labor, and that was enough. And this comes back to this question 
of corporate accountability. I, I'm not as sympathetic. Maybe you're, I'm, I'm a little more skeptical, I think, than you might be. And maybe publicly you can't say this, that Home Depot and the American companies can do more. Because I think these companies speak out of both sides of their mouth. In the one hand, they will talk a good game about corporate social responsibility, traceability, open supply chains. And on the other side, their buyers will go to the Chinese factories and say, give me the lowest price. And they push the price down low, 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 low. We see this all the time. And the Chinese manufacturers say, well, listen, if you want traceability, you want clean supply chains, that's going to cost more. There are costs involved in that. It's not free. The buyer says, that's not my problem. Yeah. The corporate social responsibility guy says, no, you must do this. And we see this in the labor all the time with Walmart and Target and other suppliers where they talk about good labor conditions in Chinese factories. And then the buyers come in the next day and say, push the price down lower and lower. And if you don't push the price down, we're going to go source from somewhere else. Also, these companies, as again, we've seen in minerals and in chocolate, do not put any resources on the ground in Africa to ensure the supply chains. So again, I think there's a lot more that these companies can do that they're not doing because it costs money. And so what do you tell these companies when they read a report like this that says, you can do more, but you're not doing more because it's expensive? You raise a uh, uh, wonderful point there. You know, we see all the paradox, you know, within, you know, all the international trade, you know, on one hand, you are chasing for the, you know, high efficiency, you know, which uh, attribute uh, all your sources globally, sometimes contributed to the low price and a good quality, the end consumer, you know, uh, is getting it. But on the hand, they might, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, kind of like, you know, uh, uh, compromise uh, some of the responsibilities, you know. Actually, we heard from, you know, on the Chinese side, you know, they are saying like, oh, all our international, uh, you know, uh, clients are requiring, uh, demanding uh, a lowest price, but how can we get that, you know? How can we ensure a low price uh, and uh, at the same time, you know, yeah, uh, ensure you know the, this uh, res uh, corporate responsibility? Something, some some compromise has been made. That's the thing there. But uh, you know, we're glad you know there uh, on at least on the end market, we have a democratic system there. You know, uh, NGOs like us or keep him, you know, keep him, uh, you know, adding pressure. Uh, I have a checked eyes on uh, all the, you know, on the, the corporations like uh, Home Depot and like uh, Jetwin. And then we're using that also as a, you know, as a, as a case to work with the government, you know, to point to them like, you know, you need us also pressure and, and not just that. You need to add in a kind of like, you know, facilitating tools and methods to make sure like, you know, the, the companies is easier to check um, uh, the legality of the, the sources. And also we advocate like, you know, we should put this under both North-South collaboration and South-South collaboration, those kind of uh, mechanism, you know, uh, previously in you know, uh, COPs, you talk about, you know, the COP meeting, you know, the COP summit every year, they spend millions of dollars and have the meeting, what's the results? Actually, we think like, you know, like timber legality, like the whole supply chain, uh, you know, enforcement, you know, collaboration should be put into the global you know, like, you know, North-South collaboration and the South-South uh, collaboration. China has declared that many uh, activities, you know, under their own, like, you know, uh, global climate, you know, South-South collaborative uh, platforms, we think that, you know, this uh, timber gap issue should be well put in the high pro priority there, you know. There's so many things they can do and they can do it right. Uh, instead of just focusing on all those, you know, infrastructure, building things, why not just, you know, including this thing and and it's like, like a low-hanging fruit to them and they can do it very correctly. But Kobus, to this point that Haibing's bringing up about how this should be included in the discourse between North-South and South-South, we've seen this kind of language in the FOCAC declarations, that's the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation Declarations that happen every three years, but yet nothing seems to come of it because it doesn't seem to be a priority for the Chinese or the African side to enforce this. The best example of this is in the blue water economy. There is a section of the FOCAC declaration that says China will support local efforts to stop illegal fishing off the coast of Africa. That is never enforced or never called up. So what's the point, Kobus, if these documents are ignored to actually include this in the discourse? 
Well, the more it's in the discourse, the harder it is to ignore, right? So I think on the African side, you know, again, taking Ivory as an example, popular kind of unhappiness in key African countries ended up kind of pushing African policymakers to put this on the agenda, even though they themselves probably didn't feel like talking about it, really. And that was then also, that was linked by kind of an outcries, popular outcries in, you know, countries like South Africa and Kenya, but also because it was hitting the tourism industry. And I think, you know, similar issues are at play with forestry as well. The problem, I think, more is that forests tend to be only in particular countries, and those particular countries happen to be in Central Africa, which is a region with particular governance problems and with with particular high, particularly kind of high levels of corruption and government impunity and so you know it is i think to, to make it clear I think to African populations, how their kind of bottom line is being hit by this, that this isn't just a conservation issue, but this is a bread and butter issue that affects national wealth. I think in order to make that point, having it in the discourse is key. But the problem is to think about how much work it actually it takes to actually move this conversation forward, particularly in the case of where the key players are governments that are so over so so have such low capacity and such high levels of corruption that that it makes it very difficult for them to kind of push them to do anything. I being just just shifting to the end of the supply chain, your colleague Rafael Edu published the op ed that Eric mentioned earlier in the Hill. So the discussion about Home Depot's role in this and its possible direct contravention of the Lacey Act is now in the mainstream media, to the extent that Politico is in the mainstream media, which you know obviously it is. In the US, have you heard any direct reaction? from Home Depot? Is there any kind of movement in the corporate side in the US to to improve supply chain um, management in in this respect? So far, uh, I haven't, you know, uh, get the latest update uh, from my colleagues, uh, but uh, my understanding from, you know, uh, uh, before the the New Year break, there's a very limited or to none, um, you know, reaction um, from the Home Depot side, you know, Um, that's uh, what I've heard, but definitely not ideal from what we hope for, but uh, we will continue engaging uh, with them and even want to, you know, express uh, the willingness to help them, you know, to build up, uh, you know, this kind of due diligence, like what's the proper due diligence to ensure you get the right material, not just right quality, but about right responsibility, including the legality of it. We have, you know, uh, tons of experience on that. You know, we have been reached out to, like, say, the global shipment, you know, uh, companies, uh, like, and they help them to, to judge or to identify, you know, which route might be highly risk and reach out uh, 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 less uh, risky and which, you know, kind of uh, uh, cargoes, you know, uh, are risky or, or not. And also uh, trying to work with them or come up with, uh, uh, you know, a set of due diligence uh, procedures, you know, so they can apply to the first hand, you know, or to the, to the first line, you know, uh, agents. Like, you know, the, uh, to try to, which was uh, all our efforts uh, working with them, try to block all the illegal cargoes out of their, you know, production uh, lines, you know, whether it's a shipping company or whether it's, you know, it's a end, end, you know, a retailer market like a you know, Home Depot. So far, you know, we have some, you know, uh, success, but uh, in large, uh, we are still want to, you know, hope to see uh, more positive reactions uh, from them, which uh, we really encourage them uh, to do so, yeah. But you can't really be surprised about their reaction because oftentimes these companies, when confronted with these sensitive supply chain issues about either illegal products or child involvement in the production process, tend to either just ignore it or lie. There was a great interview that was published online last year where Dua Lipa, the singer, asked Tim Cook if there was any cobalt in her iPhone that was mined by a child miner. And he said, no, there isn't, which, of course, is a lie, because we know that the artisanal mined cobalt is mixed in with the industrial mined cobalt to the point where you can't distinguish it. M&M, Mars, and Hershey's are confronted with the same questions about child involvement in the cocoa harvesting, and they, too, just either ignore it or lie. And so the corporations, I think, have a lot to account for, and I really hope that NGOs like you continue to put the pressure on them because there's a role for that, and it's inexcusable that they get away with not saying anything. And to me, that's, again, when we look at who's accountable, the fingers oftentimes point first at the Chinese. And I think in the current climate in the United States, that's the easiest. On Congress, they love to sit there and say the Chinese are just destroying everything, but they rarely point the finger at their own stakeholders, particularly on Capitol Hill, because a lot of these companies 
are involved in the political process as well through campaign financing. So again, we have a a lot of conflict of interest here that make it very difficult to do this. Your report and the EIA focus is on Africa, West Africa in particular, but timber comes from a lot of different places. Do you also see the same patterns in Southeast Asia, in South America, in other places that supply China with timber? Or is this a problem that is more severe in West Africa? In fact, you know, uh, our uh, you know uh, mission uh, coverage you know almost uh, globally, you know, not just Africa, but you know Latin America, Southeast Asia, definitely, or even in uh, Central Europe or Far East Europe uh, side. You know, like last year, published a, a report um, on the the Russian birch, also come a long way through the black box manufacturing hub in China, and then get through to South uh, Eastern countries uh, like Vienna, uh, Vietnam make into plywood, then uh, make the way to the EU and the US market as end product of like, you know, the cabinet uh, doors. So it's, it, which is exactly the same question, you know, you know the same problem, uh, which is we're having a uh, problematic you know, sourcing country, less, uh, you know, less governed, you know, high corruption and make it illegal harvesting um, possible. And then this kind of a profit uh, driven Chinese businessmen you know, care less about, you know, uh, legality, but more about profit. And they, they just, you know, mix that into their sources and they're getting through a very complicated, you know, uh, the trade line, which make uh, like the end market, uh, you know, either, either is EU or, or, or the US feel difficulty, you know, to put a proper trace on that. So as I said, this is uh, reflecting, you know, a uh, globalization issue, but, you know, also require uh, multiple factors, you know, multiple players. They're really working together to solve it. And uh, Erica, you raised a wonderful uh, question uh, there is like, you know, how should we solve that, you know, given all the, you know, problems, you know, in each, uh, you know, each point, you know, but uh, I think priority uh, is the key as the case uh, with climate change, you know, in China, like uh, back in 10 or 15 years ago, it's not a priority. If you try to lure in China on the negotiate, uh, negotiation table to talk about climate change, to talk about their own responsibility, you are always, uh, you know, uh, encountering with a, uh, with a cold face. But looking at right now, China has put climate change as one of the national strategy, you know, very high priority, like a number two or, or three there. And every negotiating table, they are now even bragging about, you know, their achievement in climate change, you know, the achievement in energy transition, their achievement in all the renewable energy uh, development there. Like, look at how fast they have changed. And it's a good thing to see that, you know, now they are now including, you know, timber legality, as one of the atoms under the flagship of the climate change, you know, uh, you know, as evidenced, you know, you know from this uh, sunny line uh, statement. So we hope by prioritize the uh, timber legality within the already a flagship program of climate change, we can see a uh, more heightened, you know, uh, activity uh, from the China side, and then working together with uh, with the U.S., you know, they should join hands, and uh, we can see a proper and uh, accelerated change uh, there. You know, kind of bringing it all the way back to Africa, if the U.S., like based on, on the Sunland statement, for example, if there is a some kind of way um, for the U.S. and China to move forward in, in working together on, on this issue, how would you suggest that they work with African governments, particularly in the case of, of a government like Equatorial Guinea, where the son of the president is the vice president, he, where he gets millions of dollars per year, you know, kind of from direct bribes from these companies. Like in a case of such kind of egregious and open corruption, do you think are open for US-China cooperation to try and make the actual situation a bit better on the ground? Yeah, I think on the China side, first, and, and obviously they should, you know, make it uh, extremely clear that, you know, their current forest law, you know, applies to imported timber. Because so far in Article 65, they talk about the timber legality, but uh, it's it's uh, it's not specified like, you know, it covers uh, imported timber, which could, you know, uh, create lots of confusion and, and the, the kind of lack of uh, uh, enforcement uh, on the customer side. And once they, you know, make it very clear, then the custom agency and other, you know, uh, enforcement agency have the correct authority, you know, to apply the the, the right diligence. Because now 
the lack of that, you know, uh, willingness, and, you know, because of a lack of willingness, sometimes for obvious, you know, due diligence, it's on their hands, you know, they can take it or not take it. For uh, for most of their cases, they did, they did not take it, you know, for the convenience uh, of it. But once uh, that law make it, uh, you know, very uh, explicit, then they have to uh, check it, uh, all the due diligence. And for most of the case, they can detect, uh, you know, uh, the illicit activity uh, from that, you know, uh, due diligence. And that will help because significantly, you know, it's kind of a pressure to the uh, sourcing country because now sourcing country always uh, now knows that, oh, Chinese are very serious now. They are checking on, you know, the CITES permit or everything. And, and they, they even cross reference with the, the CITES headquarters. And then we cannot make a, make it, you know, a uh, fake or, or fraud here on, on our sourcing end. Then, then they, they have to change, you know, even with the president's son, they, they have no, uh, you know, no, no other way to, to hide it. I think that's one of the direction uh, we were trying to push. And on the other hand, and like I said before, like uh, from a democratic way, because most of the sourcing country are actually, you know, a, a democratic country, you know, uh, by their uh, constitutions. So the civil society in the sourcing country can also play a, a vital role there, uh, which is uh, why we we are also, uh, you know, uh, kind of uh, enhancing our activity by engaging with them, you know, by, you know, through this kind of workshop, and through all kinds of engaging program, you know, trying to, try to build up their capacities so they can play a role, uh, like monitor the situation and, and sometimes get, and also work with international, you know, uh, uh, medias, uh, you know, once they find any problem, they can explore that and also help add in the pressure and become a part of the monitoring force there. And that's a, a brief answer to your question, yeah. Okay. Mahai Bing is an Asia policy specialist at the Environmental Investigation Agency based in Washington and one of the co-authors of The Dictator's Door, From Crimes in Equatorial Guinea's Forest to Home Depot's Customers. It's a report that was published by EIA that came out last November. If you're interested in these topics of sustainability and illegality of supply chains, this is a topic for you. This is a report that's absolutely fascinating. I'm going to put a link to both that report and also to the Hill column by uh, Hai Bing's co- uh, colleague Rafael Edu to halt global deforestation, start with Home Depot. Both of those links will be in the show notes. Hai Bing, thank you so much for taking the time today to walk us through your research and to raise some of the issues in this very, very important topic that is poorly understood. And we do appreciate your time today. Thanks, Eric and Cubs, for having me here. You know, he's always a fan of the show. Yeah. <laughs> Kobus, both you and Hai Bing reference the Sunnyland Statement, and this is when the U.S. and China got together, Xi Jinping and Joe Biden, and it speaks to this possibility of the two sides working together. And when people look at the potential of the United States and China working together, climate and environment issues always come up as the so-called low-hanging fruit, the area that's least contentious and offers the most potential. But given the current environment between these two countries and the toxicity in the relationship where not a day goes by that they're not insulting each other, they're not attacking each other, critiquing one with the other. It's hard to imagine, and there's no evidence that suggests that they're going to do anything about this together. And this is where the world actually needs the big players to enforce the rules. And if China and the United States actually enforce their own laws, then a lot of this could be contained, or at least improved. But since they're not going to work together, and I don't believe they are, I can't see it happen. What do we do? What happens? Well, you raised several issues. I'm not as pessimistic, particularly this year. Like last year, I was more pessimistic about this, but it does look that there is a a slight kind of thawing in the relationship, particularly around official cooperation around climate. So not not in any other field, but like around climate, at least, you know, kind of the pronouncements that's come out of Beijing and Washington over the last few months have made me cautiously a little bit more optimistic. Of course, a lot is going to a lot is going to depend on how the China US relationship goes this year and next year, but particularly also how it goes in the US election. And you know, the so so that's scary, I think. But at the same time, I think anyone who's really realistic about the climate issue, you know, at some stage, one comes to to a realization. What you know, the deeper you go into into climate reading, that this is the biggest thing humanity has ever faced. Like 
climate change, believe it or not, bigger than the US, bigger than China. You know, at, at, you know, really? <laughs> you know so, so in that sense, even the size and the importance of superpower relations pales in, sign- in comparison to the power and impact of climate change. So, um, you know, so, so at some stage, finding some way of working together becomes almost inevitable, no matter how toxic the relationship is. You know, the more toxic it is, obviously, the, the further it pushes back cooperation and the more it complicates it and the more it, it kind of dooms us all. But, you know, kind of, I think at some stage, anyone who is actually in the role of, of, of being a policymaker will realize, will have to realize that, they, that they, there isn't really a, in an option. Of course, what, if, if there's a Trump administration, then that kind of may, that adds a lot of additional kind of you know, a, a lot of additional energy on the on the kind of non-cooperation side, which could push cooperation back several years and again, you know, doom everyone. But in the end, you know, kind of if we are going to go ahead as a globally integrated system of some kind, then some kind of action on climate is inevitable. And hopefully within that, there will be a space for some kind of rational cooperation. You are far more optimistic than I am. I don't believe in the inevitability. The only thing that's inevitable is if we don't do anything, we all die. That's the only thing that's inevitable. Yes, and of course, you know, kind of like many countries have found it, you know, in themselves to create death cults built around inevitable destruction, you know, so I mean, that is possible. (laughs) You know, if if we don't do that, you know, then then the only other option is some form of actual cooperation. And at least what, what we have with climate is something where a there's this scientific consensus and b there's a lot of money to be made you know so you know like people some people are going to get very very rich from dealing with the climate problem and you know obviously the u.s wants to be some of those people and china already is (laughs) china already are some of those people you know chinese companies are making huge amounts of money from this and and it's only the the tip of the iceberg they're going to be making a lot of money over the next two decades and you know that at, at, at least provides some kind of like shared shared goal to work towards well it's the old chinese trope that the word in chinese for Crisis is Wei Ji, which is both danger and opportunity. So I guess that's suitable and fitting for this uh, this situation that we're facing now. Now we yes, may crisis have, unity in 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 Homo Simpson's words. <laughs> we may see a change here because both the United States and China have announced new climate envoys. Xie Jianhua he officially retired last week due to health reasons, and he's been replaced by Liu Zhenming. Liu is a longtime diplomat coming out of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, so he doesn't have a climate background. He has a political background. He's a former vice minister for foreign affairs until 2017, and then he took up a position at the United Nations, serving as the Under Secretary General for Economic and Social Affairs, and he was involved in past UN climate talks Uh, taking part in the Kyoto Protocol and the Paris Agreement negotiations for China, and he was also in Dubai at COP28. John Kerry, who is the U.S. climate czar, is I think that's the title they give these guys, he also announced that he is going to be stepping down to help Biden with the uh, election campaign. Kerry's 80 years old, so I don't know how much help he can do, but wow, these guys at 80 years old, can you imagine how much energy they have? They're so old, Kobus. They're so That's terrible. Old. <laughs> it's horrifying for me. <laughs> like when I'm 80, I'm lying down. I'm not going on the campaign trail. <laughs> I so don't want to be working as hard as these guys do when I'm 80. But uh, so anyway, so that might be an opportunity to have some new blood at the top of the US and China climate negotiating table. But let's talk about the African side of this, because this is also where the African Union seems like it could take a role. African governments will not punish other African governments, okay? So you're not going to see Kenya throwing shade towards the Equatorial Guineans over this, right? Am I, am, I, am I correct in saying and assuming that? That's just not the way it works in African politics. Yeah, I, I tend to think so, yes. So the African Union, though, could be the one that says, hey, Equatorial Guinea, this isn't right. And there could be sanctions or there could be measures or there could be pressure applied from a regional or pan-continental group, right? I mean, when we, we have to put some accountability onto the African side as much as we're going to put on the U.S., China, and the corporate side. So what can be done 
to a government like Equatorial Guinea, but not even just Equatorial Guinea. Ghana, Nigeria, Gabon, Republic of Congo, DRC, any number of these countries, as we've pointed out, have the same problems. What can be done on the African side, do you think? So I think on the African side, obviously, African Union pressure is one factor, um, and particularly kind of pressure around a kind of a moral slash governance kind of aspect around it. You know that there, there is a certain amount of push coming from African institutions on, on that issue. I think... Here, sadly, as you know, kind of at the beginning, you you were talking about the use or uselessness of of summits like COP28. This is where they come in, I think, because what we need to set up over the next the next few years, the sooner the better, is some form of of carbon offset and trading system. And I know many many climate people are extremely cynical about carbon offsets for good reasons, um, among others because they're not being monitored. But if it is actually possible to connect carbon offset systems where people who do pollute in the short or medium term have to pay to maintain intact ecosystems in, in other countries, and those are then monitored on a, on a kind of comprehensive level, then what, you know, once those, that kind of system is in, which admittedly is, is a big if, then a country like Equatorial Guinea can simply be starved from them right kind of like it it can simply be well sorry we can't include you in the system because you don't have you know governance or you don't have you don't have monitoring you don't have evaluation systems bye-bye you know we're gonna rather work with ghana say who is now implementing in my fantasy ghana is now implementing the system say you know so so in that sense once once that kind of system is up then it provides another kind of like carrot and stick system that actually adds a little bit of leverage in a way that's quite understandable to these countries beyond simply oh our beautiful forests we need to protect them right kind of which which you know doesn't have any traction at all so in that sense like setting up some this is why these these climate summits maddening as they are are kind of kind of crucial is because the only way to really move forward with any form of climate you know kind of mitigation that really has real impact is to set up systems that are are global and that are enforceable you know similar to the shipping system currently right countries are are taking part in 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 a kind of a global rules-based shipping system as a kind of a global public good and if they are bad you know kind of in 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 different ways if say for example they engage in piracy for example or you know kind of other forms of breaking that system then there are some forms of tools to force some form of to put some pressure on them to force some kind of compliance so we, we need similar kind of global systems around climate and particularly around things like forest governance and in order to do that like you, you, there's no way around it you just have to build those systems and that you have to build them involving the countries with tropical forests and, and and this at this cop there was already meetings from these countries with tropical forests including several west african countries so it is in theory possible to build from these kind of structures that we already have and and kind of and make them more enforceable we just have to actually do it and once we do then that changes the way that you know then then the kind of kicking out a country like equatorial guinea from a kind of a forest opec you know becomes a, a realistic thing to talk about at the moment it's not and it will take a, f- a few years to build it up but like eventually there's no other way around it we have to build it up. Well, one place that I would keep an eye out for is the fentanyl trade. And I know it seems a little bit random to be talking about fentanyl in the context of timber, but hear me out here. This is an area where China, the US, and a developing country, in this particular case it's Mexico, are incentivized to actually work together. And so if the pathways of cooperation, of tripartite cooperation, can be built in fentanyl, then uh, in in combating fentanyl, then we might be able to apply that same model over to other issues like timber, cocoa, cobalt, shark fin, any number of different resources. The Chinese now coming under pressure from the Mexicans to control the fentanyl trade that in terms of the inputs, the chemical inputs that are coming from China into Mexico that are be assembled in Mexico by the cartels and then brought over the border to the U.S. for consumption. All three have a stake now. China, for a long time, said it didn't have a stake because it said it's not our problem. We're not involved in this. We're just ex- they didn't acknowledge it, but they were just exporting the raw materials that made fentanyl. Now the Mexicans are saying <clears throat> this is causing us a big problem. You got to help us. It's causing us a problem with the U.S. It's causing us a problem with the cartels, and it's causing a problem with our own people. It's destabilizing. 
So I think if we can see some of the neural networks develop among these three parties in fentanyl, we might be able to get a precedent that we could apply to timber. Maybe, just maybe. I'm a little bit less hopeful than you are about U.S.-China cooperation. Maybe it's because I'm in the U.S. right now and all I hear is just acid (laughs) about the Chinese. No one has anything good to say. So it's hard for me to see a scenario where they can cooperate constructively. But maybe from your vantage point, when I'm back in Vietnam, I'll have a different point of view on that. So anyway, this was a great way to kick off the year. This is our second year of doing this show, our 15th year of doing our Africa show, which drops every Friday. So if you're interested in China, Africa, go and subscribe to that podcast and you'll get all of the podcasts there. Of course, if you're interested in these topics that we cover on a deep dive every single day, go and subscribe at chinaglobalsouth.com slash subscribe. We'll give you the first 30 days for free. Your subscription also supports independent journalism in this day of polarized media AI-generated content, just lots of crap content out there. We've got a great team of 10 editors in Asia, Africa, and the Middle East producing some amazing work, and research is coming out, analysis, videos, podcasts, all these great things. And so we're just really supportive of everybody on Patreon who supports us, as well as their subscribers. So once again, if you'd like to support the work we're doing, chinaglobalsouth.com slash subscribe. Your subscription is so greatly appreciated. Thank you so much. Kobus and I will be back again next week with another episode of the China Global South podcast. I'm trying to book shows on the South China Sea conflict, what's going on in the Red Sea, Middle East diplomacy, India, China ties. So much is going on right now. And also Wang Yi's trip to Brazil. So I've got a long list of experts that I'm hoping we're going to be able to interview to bring you some fascinating shows about everything that China's doing in the global south. So stay tuned to this feed. We'll be back again soon with another episode. So for Kobus van Staden in Johannesburg, I'm Eric Olander. Thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Follow the China Global South Project on Twitter at China GS Project and share your thoughts on today's show or head over to our website at ChinaGlobalSouth.com where you can subscribe to receive full access to more than 5,000 articles and podcasts. Once again, that's ChinaGlobalSouth.com.